So, you know, I spent the week in uh, in San Diego with my family and we, uh, we sit on the beach, but it's a long way back to the house. You have to cross the sand. The sand is hot. My son figured out pretty quickly that it's a, lo- a long way to go back. So imagine at one point there's like 20 of us sitting outside. Everybody's just sitting in the sun. The kids are playing the sand. They'll dig in the sand for hours. And I look over and I'm like, what the hell is Max doing? Because he's got that smile. Sure. Like there's always that smile. And, you know, it's it, it's super bright and sunny. So the kids are wearing long sleeve swim shirts and they're wearing their shorts. And he's standing in like ankle deep water facing us probably 60 feet away. And he's like smirking. And I'm like, and my eyes are terrible. I'm like, what the hell? And then I see a stream coming out of his shorts. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, that little shit is standing in ankle deep water just peeing. Sure. Just, just peeing. On, and I'm like, what am I going to do? Like, I can't get to him in time. And I was just like, all right, it's just fine. It's the ocean. Buy it, please. It's fine. I know. No one cares. Yeah. But then I do it and people start and calling four, the police and shit. As three, they should. Two. <laughs> Presents a truly terrible podcast. Welcome to Nonsense episode number 29. I'm Jeff Parker. And I'm CJ Little. This is our take on the week's business tech and entertainment headlines. This time, we'll look at detonating a hydrogen bomb. Then we'll talk about what's new in the world of electric cars. Can you explain how those two things go together exactly? I cannot. So do you put the bomb behind the car? Clearly, we spin the wheel of topics. And we, we might want to have a pre-production meeting because one of these days, one of us is going to do <laughs> should align. putting a hydrogen bomb in your electric car. And totally. we're going to be stuck because it's going to be the same segment. I feel like, at least we're not talking about AI this week. We should get a big wheel, like you said, the wheel of topics. Every other one should be AI, and then we'll just put other <laughs> shit in between it and spin well, it. Well, there's so much stuff that happens in AI every week. We totally could do, a, true. do an update. I mean, well, this this week it would be who's suing AI companies because yeah. that's really the news of the week. Could we also just on the the topics wheel? Could we just put in demise of Twitter on every other square and just see what's happening? <laughs> There'd be something new to talk about. Eventually, like, there won't, eventually there won't be. Eventually, just it's, gonna, just, it's, it's ground down to nothing. <laughs> it's International Chess Day. Speaking of AI, International Chess Day. The day was an idea hatched by the United. United Nations Educational, Scientific, and Cultural Organization, UNESCO, to celebrate people who play the game chess. I love the game chess. I didn't know they had a day. Is there a checkers day? September 23rd, but that's a totally different thing. Well, that would be more for us. It celebrates Richard Nixon's dog. Or maybe International Hangman Day. I loved... Did that's you play chess different. as a kid? I poorly. I loved... My my father taught me how to yeah. play chess, and I absolutely loved playing chess. I, I liked playing it until I realized that there's this whole like rote memorization you've got to get through in order yes. to be really good, and then I just was not interested. My son yeah. was obsessed with uh-huh. chess. I mean, like championship trophies sure. and the whole thing and i was like it's 64 squares at a certain point you need to not be obsessed with chess sure the world is bigger than sure. 64 squares and more complex but he just just loved it i loved it too when i was a kid so i get it it's also national moon day like drop my pants moon that's one small step for man one giant leap for mankind and uh one pull, huge ass on that guy and, and pull up your pants national moon day <laughs> celebrates not only the historic lunar landing on july 20th 1969 the day also reminds us of the uphill slog to get the space program literally off the ground. On National Moon Day, we remember both the quirky and profound moments in the space race that ended up with the Americans being the first to plant their flag on the moon. That was a that was kind of not certain either then. Once you get the flag up, are you going to build the library behind it? Is that how that works? Well, first of all, they just put the flag in a studio in Hollywood, right? I mean, that's all that was. I think that helped, pl- pardon the pun, plant the flag of us being a superpower. Like, I, oh, yeah, I got think there, there were other things that made us a superpower. Sure. Like, like hydrogen bombs. Economics. Oh. And hydrogen bombs <laughs> hydrogen as well. Bombs. I mean, really more economics even than hydrogen sure. bombs. That was like 54 years ago. Yeah. It really wasn't that long ago if you think about it. Oh, dude. Right? I watched it as a child. Really? I watched it on a black and white yeah. TV. We had a black and white TV and we watched it obsessively. That's amazing. I mean, it's kind of crazy to realize, maybe more crazy for me than for you, but like even in the mid 80s, sort of the height of the the shuttle program. Yeah. It had only been 15 years since you'd put somebody on really the moon. in space oh, and, yeah, yeah. And, and on the moon. And literally just because <clears throat> a president declared it, he yeah, threw, down, it. threw down a challenge. And we, yeah. I mean, it, a ton of money was wasted. If you went to Aerojet sure. in the uh, late 60s, early 70s, all of the bathroom stalls had cigar lighters. <laughs> I mean, because they were just pouring oh, a great. fire hose of money at them. That's great. But it got the job done. They got it. They, they got us up there. Totally. How is your week going? It was good. We spent a week on, on holiday yeah. down in uh, the great great city of san diego it's very british of you at, at the beach very yes the holiday my kids peed in the ocean a lot which well, was okay good. Um, i'm also <laughs> amazed that you can give children shovels and sand and you won't see them for five hours oh yeah that's the end they will just dig and dig and dig and sure. dig and dig what are they digging for i showed them where you can dig for the sand crabs and that amused them uh-huh. but then they just keep digging and then we had a sand castle making competition which my job on my team was to keep my children from destroying what the other kids built which is not easy because yeah. you have to be like a rodeo clown but my youngest son i told him to go to go get 
seaweed. We're going to use seaweed to decorate the um, the sand castle. The sand castle. Yeah. That kid spent forty minutes just collecting seaweed. Well, up you got to get beach. the right seaweed. You no, he did. No, yeah. he did. Like the long stringy kind. The kid yeah, loved yeah. it. I'm like, oh man, his OCD is strong with seaweed. <laughs> and then the big one wanted to smash stuff, but I didn't let him smash stuff until the end. Let's get to our headlines. We are having a heat wave all across the country. Have you been paying attention? Oh, to I this? didn't notice that it's 120 outside. Oh, it's incredibly hot from the Pacific Northwest to the tip of Florida. We are having record heat. Except that in the in the northeast, right? The north we the northeast is, they had heavy storms and excessive rain. They literally had to cancel uh, 1,300 flights over the weekend. That's a lot of flights. Yeah, but it's hot but as hell everywhere else. They're currently having a record consecutive streak of 110 degree days. 110 degree <laughs> I mean, days in of, Phoenix. In Phoenix. The fact that they already have a record of 110 successive days in Phoenix. I have a lot of family in Phoenix, uh, including my father-in-law. This is always the joke he makes. I'll be like, hey, how's the how's it going in Phoenix? He's like, oh, it's it's, it's just cold. We're in a cold spell. <laughs> I'll be like, really? He'll be like, yeah, I didn't get past 105. No, right. <laughs> oh, geez, he's a smart ass. Every single time he gets me on the same joke. It's not just that it's 115 in yeah. Phoenix. It's that it's like 96 at night. Oh, it's it's miserable. It's miserable. It you never go, cools oh, down. Oh, my God. You go, and you can just feel the heat radiating off the pavement. And you and, go outside. And the your in-laws are not the ones who worry me. It's the homeless people who are yeah, out living sure. in the, and they literally yeah. never have a chance to cool down. No, their, you don't bodies, cool down. I know. their bodies never get to cool down. We talk about having record heat and Australians just laugh at us. Yeah, absolutely. Because they've had just record insane. Heat and giant fucking spiders. Just, yeah, just insane, crazy heat. Anyway, the interesting thing to me about this was uh, Howard Diamond's quote. An average summer today, for example, might have been considered a hot summer several decades ago. Likewise, a hot summer in the future may very well be considered an average one a few decades from now. Howard is the Climate Science Program Manager at the National Oceanic Atmospheric Administration's Air Resources Laboratory. Yeah. So SAG-AFTRA has gone on strike. Uh, If you watched Fran Drescher's speech, I thought she was absolutely amazing. I did not see it. She was great. The Screen Actors Guild is particularly concerned about the use of AI to create digital likenesses of actors without ongoing consent or appropriate compensation. Sure. That is to say, once you're in a movie, we can use your image forevermore to be in movies and things. Not to be uh, wet blanket on this, isn't the alternative to just use artificial everything right there's no reason to have a person even be a model i mean so you're getting one more payment than you would get otherwise i mean i I, that's true i'm not trying to get rid of actors but i'm saying of course of course but like in some cases like you have like seat fillers i think it's true for uh you know background characters if you watch there's lots of tv shows that are using real ai non-human backgrounds and they look perfect i love that you said real ai non-humans real (laughs) ai non-humans don't think don't think the ai is fake it's not by the way i also love like imagine if you had like the audience shot at like the Emmys and like it just glitches for a second and half the automatic seat Everybody like disappears. disappears. <laughs> You're like, fuck, that place is empty. Like nobody's going to that anymore. <laughs> Ever since Ricky stopped hosting the Golden Globes, nobody goes. As it turns out, the last time SAG and the WGA went on strike together yeah. was 63 years ago. What difference does it make if they go on strike together? Because once you're not able to have writers, what are you shooting? Well, you could be shooting shit that was already written. Okay, but you run out of that really fast. Well, I understand. I, I feel like you need these two parts to get like, it's like Voltron. Like you need all the Power Rangers. You can't sure. just, you can't have sure. no legs. Then you're just Private Dan. Right. Like you need to have all the parts together. <laughs> Sorry, Private Dan. But yeah, it's been 63 years. So you know, we don't want AIs writing scripts. Well, if AI, first of all, you don't have a problem because AIs can't, sure. can't write scripts. They don't write. Yet. I have yet to see an AI who can actually write a joke that's funny. I know there are other people who disagree with me. I have sure. yet to see it, and I've looked at a lot of AI. I have yet to see an AI sure. who can come up with an original story. Okay, there's no creativity in it. Sure. They're great at doing things. Real estate copy, I always use as an example. Things where you expect them to flow I mean, as they would flow. They have no ability to create things that that, that are something you haven't seen before, which sure. is what you're going to do in a, in a script mostly. So ignore for a second that AI can't write a script. Okay. The minute AI could write a script, if AI actually could write good scripts, yep. it doesn't matter that you would go on strike about this. It sure. doesn't matter that you would sure. have it in your agreement the Producers Guild couldn't use them because some other schmo is going to make a movie that is outside of the guild and if the sure. story's great, the story's great and the sure. movie's going to be fun and people sure. are going to go see it and that's the end of that because well, now yeah. a whole nother a group of people will be able to make movies. Well, then you get Iowa. I don't know what that is. It's the AI Writers Guild. Yes. All the AIs get together and they have their own guild. And, like, and These they say, people. No, no films humans. written by humans. No humans at all. We all need uh, AI directors and Christopher Nolan. That's exactly. it. I read a little bit of this article. One where Christopher Nolan says Oppenheimer should be a cautionary tale about AI. I, he was more, I think, alluding to like mm, like the launch of like nuclear weapons and those being controlled yeah, yeah, by, of course, of by, course. by artificial intelligence and not being a human behind it. I don't think we're going to allow nuclear weapons to be launched by AI anytime sure. soon. We don't even let them I be mean, launched by procedural coding. Sure. We literally 
have a human, human. There's meat. in between. There's meat in between to you stop know, you from pushing there's that There's some button. crazy stories around this that we should highlight at some point on the show. Like, for example, my understanding during the Cuban Missile Crisis is that Russian soldiers had direct orders that if they were pressed by U.S. naval forces, U.S. military forces, to just launch. Yeah. And they were like, yeah, that's fucking dumb. And they didn't follow their orders and beautiful, didn't do it. Beautiful, beautiful. Because they were just like, well, you know how this all ends. You could teach an AI that, and I could also just be like, yeah, I'm just going to ignore that. Like, but the AI I can also go off. Matthew Broderick should start a movie about this. That would be great. That would be wonderful. That wasn't AI. No, it was a Whopper. Like a bird. The War Operations oh, yeah. <laughs> WOPR. <laughs> yeah. Whopper with cheese. You have a good memory. Well, I love that movie. That was like the, the, one of the defining movies of my childhood. Shall we play a game? Would you like to play a game? No, I use the line from that all the time. The only way to win is not to play. Engagement on Instagram threads. Have you, are you on Instagram threads? I am on Instagram threads. Uh, I think I'm an influencer on Instagram threads. You're an influencer? Hey, in the land of the blind, man, the one eye is king. <laughs> Instagram's engagement has uh, on threads has cratered. Yeah, of course. I mean, they had like their big rollout part. Party last week gone from 20 minutes to eight minutes all right all they have to do is dial up the anger level and <laughs> put things on there that make you more totally. agitated and they bring that right up i mean, I mean literally mean, literally that's how it works on facebook you totally. literally could dial it right yeah, yeah. right up yeah just set it to 11 always 11 yeah look i i'm i'm gonna remain hopelessly optimistic that they're gonna try to win on features and because they're supporting activity pub they're gonna make the content hopefully open haven't seen them do that yet well they're not i mean i know they said they would it's super feature light it's also been like two weeks but now's the time if you're gonna switch to activity pub do it now before you you know get get too far out you launched this last week and promised a bunch of shit it's been 10 where is where Where is is it i want it right now it's just software (laughs) what's the problem it is just software i don't i don't know what the problem totally i'm impressed they were able to take that kind of onboarding and not fall over they seem to be doing a they reason. know they know how to do they got the best they're, sre team in the fucking yeah, world it's There's there no, are many things where yeah. where zuck will trip over himself left and right like you know doing anything human but as far as standing up one of these kind of services and social media sure. generally he's really good at this. sure meanwhile elon musk says twitter's ad revenue has dropped by 50 percent oh i wonder why shocking isn't it weird just fire all the way down just just fix this problem if you with just costs. if you just yep. cut more that, just cut that more. would that's be the, the answer yeah. that's always yep. the answer you want to, that's the best way to grow is to cut it's, it's the old business axiom cut your way to growth cut your way to growth exactly this should be filed in the big surprise category i think it's over i know you think it's over and you, then i keep you, you i keep know going, i think oh, it's over. slow death but then i look at some of the numbers they've they've talked about and i'm like wait a minute how is this thing like it's just dead man's walking yeah so then then the context of what's happening here starts to make more sense like if you are this close to the end right and you're like you're running out of life support options right there was literally two months where they were pulling in 7.6 million dollars a month that's Mm -hmm. it which is crazy because they financed like 10 plus of this thing so Ugh. so you've got to make a, a fucking interest payment just to keep the lights going yeah. of $1.5 well, billion. Pay, dollars. He doesn't pay his bills, so that's it's a lot point. easier. It's much Which easier. Is much easier. I never thought about it that way. Yeah. That's actually a better way to go is just get those big payments and then just don't make them. By the way, so you're sitting on whatever, $10 billion of debt of this thing. What the fuck do you seize? What's your collateral? Did he post anything? Do you there's, know? The, uh, did you he know, post Tesla stock? I would imagine something. For, the, for the bank debt he did. Right? Yes. So yes. there's something. For there. other debt. No. God, I mean, if there's if there's individual shareholders. The Berlin Wall coming down, right? Everyone's just going to get a piece and bring it home. It's just going to all just... It's fascinating to watch from a distance. You know, I don't know. I kind of want to like put on a hard hat and get close. Yeah. You kind of. <laughs> like, it's interesting. I'm very fascinated to see how this thing's going to come apart. Like, it, it, I don't know how it can. I also think it's just generally speaking crazy that like the EU is like, hey, it's kind of important. You know, the data and privacy of our users in the US yeah. were just like, eh. Part of the problem was, part of what the EU wants is they don't want the data from EU citizens coming sure. back to the US. Yeah. And that's essentially the same thing we're asking for from TikTok. Sure. We don't want our data going off of our shores. Yeah. Sure. So same sort of thing. So it's understandable that the EU would want that. Anyway, Elon's got a service that's uh, deflating quickly. And Although he, gets, he claims all the advertisers are coming back, or at least say they're coming back. You know what is another great idea when your av- revenue is way down is to pay out a big portion of that to your to the people on your platform. Get rid of even more of that money. I think it's a desperation move. When you put it all together, because I, I really think they financed like 10 or $11 billion of that thing. Wow. Some massive number. Russia has banned Apple devices for state officials. Because they don't have Tetris. They are afraid that Apple is uh, allowing or assisting in spying operation by U.S. intelligence agencies. Probably. I think it's probably true. I think sure. they're probably not wrong. Yeah. yeah. And by the way, if they switched 
switched all to Android phones, they're going to have the same problem exactly. because Google has to comply with U.S. Yeah. laws. They you're, don't have much you, choice. Guys, you're Warfront broadcasting clear text. I don't think Apple phones is your biggest yeah, problem. That's your, not your biggest worry. I think that's in the true. order of technology problems, you might want to start somewhere around the clear text broadcast. This was also a story that was now last week, but we didn't talk about it, which was Meta was buying tax data from online tax services. Oh, wow. There were tons of in services. The US? Yes. There were tons of services you could go online under their little website and you could sure. do your taxes sure. and submit your taxes yeah. on for free. For free. Right? Of course it's free. They were selling that data. You to are the product. Yes. They were selling that data to Meta. What does Meta do with that? They bundle it with bundle the it rest of their else. information. So when they want to sell it to advertisers, sure. remember, they show me show me everybody who makes $200,000 or sure. more, and then I can sell them my Merce- Mercedes Benz or whatever sure. it is that I want to advertise to. Air fryers. It's all air fryers. Ford has dropped the F-150 Lightning prices by up to $10,000. Yeah, I heard about this. These are uh, really cool trucks, and they are dropping them down almost to the price that they said they were going to sell them for originally. Almost God, to the original God price. Almost, yeah, weird. The, almost fulfilling what they weird. said they would do originally. Yes, and that car industry slowing down a little bit. But generally and broadly, electric car prices are are descending. A Tesla has lowered prices probably five times in the last 12 months. That's crazy. Yeah. That's a lot of times. That is what is happening with electric car prices. Well, we're going to talk about this in just a little bit, but I, I think that's uh, pretty impressive. That's cool. Part of it is just because they are able to deliver more trucks than they were uh, expecting that they would be able to. That's good. The F-150 Lightning owners will be able to top up their vehicle's battery at more than 12,000 Tesla. Tesla superchargers across the U.S. and Canada. That's cool. I don't own one. I haven't owned one. It's a good but, looking, but a good looking truck. I'm yeah. impressed. It, it's one of the more impressive EVs I've been in. And the other fun thing you can do with it is... Uh, charge your Tesla. You can charge your other right? cars because the battery is so yeah. big. Yeah. yeah, I think that's awesome. Okay, enough with the headlines. Up next, CJ is going to talk about a top secret plan by the United States Air Force to detonate a nuclear bomb. Well, they did it a couple times. It wasn't so top secret. They kind of let the world know. By the time we're talking about it on the podcast, that <laughs> whole top no secret top thing secret. is out the window. Yeah, by the way, if we're breaking the news on this, yeah. Something really bad has happened in the chain of custody everywhere. All let's, right. Let's go. Tell me all about it. Hit the button. So last week, I think was a lot of fun for both of us, right? Oh, super fun. And based on the feedback that I've heard, our listeners seem to have enjoyed it. I mean, what is not to love about the James Webb Space Telescope? Yeah. And there's even more news. There's even more news on it this week, which is pretty nice. But there's just going to be a flow. We're, I know, we're 10 week. minutes into this thing and the amount of interesting stuff coming out of it. It's like it's a year old. Yeah. And you're like, guys, settle down. You got 20 years of this. And they're like, this is literally the data is going to just keep it's coming. It's incredible. So I find the science that Webb is delivering to be like kind of unthinkable, right? Like almost unbelievable, yeah. right? Like the ability to see back to the dawn of the universe is, to me is just is just mind boggling. So I wanted to keep with this hard to believe it in space theme and then more importantly, not include AI because I feel like it's been a nice break from that. Sure. Uh, and then seeing that it's National Moon Day, I thought it'd be a good time to talk about Leonard Rifle. What day would be better to talk about Leonard Rifle than, than National today, Moon right? Day? Right. Now this is a man that I presume really hated the moon. Is that right? I don't know. Are you familiar with Mr. Rifle? No, I, I, may, I was actually being silly when I said that. Do you know I anything I have, that no he's idea done? Who, I have no idea who Mr. Rifle is. I'll tell you a little bit about him. Rifle was born in Chicago in 1927. His father was a silversmith credited with inventing a slide saxophone. Oh, cool. Whatever happened to the slide saxophone? Like a trombone, right? Only a saxophone. That's awesome. It's got more valves on it. I don't know. His mother was a district superintendent in the Chicago public school system. He earned a bachelor's and master's degree as well as a doctorate in electrical engineering okay. from the Illinois Institute of Technology, or I think they just called it IT, between 1947 <laughs> and 1953. I don't Okay. I presume they called it a hit. No angry letters. He began his career at the University of Chicago's Institute for Nuclear Studies. Okay. He helped a guy by the name of Enrico Fermi construct a 450-inch cyclotron. He's What's class- a cyclotron? Cyclotron um, was sort of our first step forward in smashing stuff together. Sorry. Okay. Accelerating particles. Gotcha. So instead of having a linear accelerator, which is all we had at the time, where you would only have a particle cross the accelerated field once, Mm -hmm. and a cyclotron, there would be like a spiral, so it could cross multiple times, like the particle would follow a spiral. Cyclotron, to me, sounds like something I might use at SoulCycle. Uh, It's not something that I would see at a carnival that I would want my kids to go on. Right, right. Like, you're definitely going to throw up if you're on the cyclotron. Get on it. So Rifle also collaborated with German scientists that were recruited in America as part of the Operation Paperclip. Which was what? We basically took all the German engineers after the war and brought them back whether they wanted or not mm-hmm. to the u.s to be employed by the u.s government it was basically always a good of, idea yeah always a good idea to just go, go just, just commandeer the smart people bring them back and just drag them all back here 
but but we should not. we should in, you know do it with incentives now. We, you would really, hope. really the way you want to do that is more carrot less stick. Yes. So especially with smart people because they can think, bite back totally. Rifle was involved in several positions in NASA's Apollo program. Mm -hmm. He went from being a consultant uh, on the possibility of life on the moon to become the deputy director of the project and was in this role from like sixty five to sixty nine. The good years. Those were definitely the good years. He won a Peabody in nineteen sixty eight for his work on the radio program The World Tomorrow. Is that a soap opera? That's the a world great name. Tomorrow. <laughs> That's the world tomorrow turns. <laughs> his experience with broadcasting led him to invent the Telestrator as a visual aid for his programming. He first used the Telestrator as part of a backyard safari program before convincing the WBBM TV weatherman John Coughlin to use it as part of his forecast. I was going to just say to you, can you explain briefly what a Telestrator oh, is yeah, for people who don't know? So it's uh, it's like what you see when you watch American football and they yes. draw on the screen, right? And it actually went from being used by the weatherman to the sports anchor Johnny Morris, which started using it for sports broadcasting. So this yeah. guy invented the Telestrator, it's right? Used which you still see used to this day. Right. Yeah, super cool. He held over 50 different patents for his inventions, right? This guy was pretty prolific. So all, all those achievements to me are super Super interesting. Mm -hmm. None of them are what I want to talk about today. But I want to talk well, about. I'm glad you brought them up. <laughs> good. I want to talk about Project A one one nine. Oh, because last we were we were going to talk about A one one eight, but now no. that you mention it, let's go. Let's go with A one one nine. Yeah. Also known as a study of lunar research flights, Volume One. Oh, Volume One. Volume One. You familiar with this? You no. seem to know a lot. About Absolutely it. No, not. Just fake it until you make it. <laughs> not even. So this was a. Top there is not one listener. I'd be shocked if you there is were. not one Nobody listener knows. who thinks I have any idea no. what you're talking about. No, there's probably one. There's probably one that doesn't know you. No. It's like, oh, he seems to know. No. This was a top secret plan developed in 1958 by the U.S. Air Force. The aim of the project was simple to detonate a hydrogen bomb on the moon always a good idea what, right? what, what, did, he, what did he have against the moon well we were out of spaces here to the detonate bombs, bombs so sure. we decided the moon would be a good place to go let's talk a little bit about what this was before we talk about the why okay hydrogen bombs were vastly more destructive than the atomic bomb dropped on hiroshima in 1945 okay and the latest in nuclear weapon design at the time now why are they more destructive they give a much bigger yield and they don't destroy the buildings um, they only destroy the living creatures the, the, the people right yeah well heat. unless you're really close to the the ground zero. But sure. Yeah. So they asked to fast track the project by senior officials in the Air Force. So Rifle produced many reports between May of 58 and January 59 on the feasibility of this plan. That's why kids typing is dangerous. <laughs> typing is totally dangerous. You don't you, want to type. You would convince people of things you probably shouldn't. Sure. And then you can you can make reports and they'll believe the it. The pen is mightier than the sword. It really, really actually is. So the Air Force quickly vetoed the idea of using the hydrogen bomb due to the Thank weight. Thank goodness. Right. Oh, due oh, to the oh, weight. That's oh, yeah. why. Oh, due to the weight. Hold on. Yeah, we're not done. Don't get ahead of yourself. Because they said it would be too heavy to be propelled by the missile, which would have oh, been Oh, but used. other than that, let's just get right to it. So they decided to use a W-25, which was a small, lightweight warhead with a relatively low 1.7 kiloton yield. Ay, ay, ay. By contrast, the little boy bomb dropped on the Japanese city of Hiroshima in 45 had a yield of 13 to 18 kilotons. Ay. Talking about one-tenth of Hiroshima, sure. give or take. The plan was they'd put the W-25 warhead on a rocket, shot towards the shadowed side of the moon, mm -hmm. where it would detonate on impact. The dust cloud that was kicked up from the resulting explosion would be lit by the sun and therefore visible from Earth. Yeah. So according to Rifle, also you might screw up the moon's orbit. Not. Uh, <laughs> nah. Probably not. Probably not with a blast this small. Okay, but I don't want probably used when it comes to destroying <laughs> to the, the moon's moon? orbit because that's kind moon. of important to us. So according to Rifle, the Air Force progress uh, in the development of intercontinental ballistic missiles would have made such a launch feasible by 1959. So like, wow, this could have happened. Now the question you brought up is a good question. Why? What what could you possibly imagine would be our reasoning for doing this? Why would we want to? To launch a nuclear weapon at the at, moon? At the moon. We're just pissed off at those moon moonians. They're not even Martians. The, the moon, whatever they call the people who live on the moon. Yep. Obviously, the only reason you want to do that in 1959 is you want to show a force. Show a force, right? Yeah, yeah. So there was this like very thin veil of like there's some rudimentary scientific questions about the moon that we get answered by trying to blow a chunk of it up. But it's a really, horrible idea. Yeah. By blowing it up specifically on the Terminator line, right, which is that line between the light side light and the dark, and dark side yeah. of the moon, this, this flash would be visible to anybody on Earth. Right. Particularly, this, this is monkey chest thumping. Yes, exactly. Particularly and nothing more. Anybody in the Kremlin. So you'd want to, you'd want them to see this. And I'm pretty sure if they were to do this, they'd want to make sure that when it hit, the moon was it. pointed at Russia so right. that they could see this and be like, oh, you guys are doing some shit. So some background on this that I thought was important, and the BBC gave a great sort of concise history on this. Hmm. And in the 50s, it really didn't look like America was winning the Cold War, right? Oh, Political, yeah, correct, correct. Popular opinion was, was in right. the U.S. was that the Soviet Union was ahead in its nuclear arsenal, particularly they, in the they were launching They were launching dogs into space. Well, yeah. So With no way to get them back. <laughs> Yeah. So particularly in development and number of nuclear bombs. So we had this sort of this bomber gap and then the nuclear missiles, the missile gap. 
Those are the two big ones that we had. In 52, the U.S. had exploded the first hydrogen bomb. Three years later, the Soviets shocked Washington by doing the same, Mm -hmm. right? In 57, they went one better, stealing a lead in the space race with the launch of Sputnik 1, which was the first artificial satellite in orbit around the world. It didn't help that uh, Sputnik was launched on top of a Soviet intercontinental ballistic missile, right? An ICBM, uh, even though it was a slightly modified one. But the U.S.'s own attempt to launch an artificial moon ended in a huge fiery explosion. An artificial moon? Yeah, a satellite. Oh, right. Like anything you put up. The failed launch of the Vanguard Test Vehicle 3 was commonly referred to at the time as Flopnik and Kaputnik. Oh my God, that's awesome. Which I thought was comedy. Kaputnik I've heard. I've never heard Flopnik. I've never heard Flopnik. Flopnik. Yeah, Flopnik I thought was great. As it turns out, by the way, I thought this was was an interesting aside. The Vanguard satellite that was on top of uh, Flopnik, the Vanguard satellite was thrown free of the explosion and recovered. But because of the damage, it could not be repaired for another launch attempt. It's currently on display at the Smithsonian, National Air and Space Museum in D.C., which I think we need a nonsense on location recording. Field trip we might too, need a field trip, right? yeah. So that's pretty cool. That's like literally the first thing we tried to put, not the first thing, but the first thing that we b- believe we're going to make it into space to orbit. Sure. And it's just sitting in the Smithsonian, which is pretty incredible. Anyway. It's a testament to our uh, failures. Well, and our tenacity too, right? right. Like our tenacity. Because eventually we got there. Doing it. Yeah, because yeah. we got there. Vanguard failed. We were behind in, in the U.S., Fortunately, the project was never carried out, right? This project A1. Oh my goodness, fortunately. That's right? crazy. So Air Force, quote, Air Force officials decided its risks outweighed its benefits. Boy. Good job, guys. And they also determined that a moon landing would- Let's make, have, let's make the moon toxic for another totally. 50 years or 100 sure. years or whatever. But they believed that a moon landing would undoubtedly be a more popular achievement in the eyes of the American and international public alike. Oh, for sure. Especially right? if you're able to bring the people back. Yeah. But as you already highlighted, the loss of a pristine lunar and environment was way less of a worry to the U.S. Air Force, right? Despite crazy. the science's concerns. Absolutely crazy. One of the fears was that if executed, the plan might have led to a potential militarization of space, which I don't really think you need the word potential in there. Yeah. Interesting. Although militarizing space is super expensive. Sure. It's much easier to militarize like a bridge. Sure. Yeah. They're closer. <laughs> yeah. And they're more to. useful. An identical project by the Soviet Union it's called Project E-4 also never came to fruition. E-4 was the fourth in a series of proposals that the Soviets started in January 58, so the exact okay. same time. Uh-huh. Project E-1 entailed plans to reach the moon. Projects E-2 and E-3 involve sending a probe around the far side of the moon to take some photos. Uh-huh. And then the final stage of the project, E-4, was to be a nuclear strike on the moon as a display of force. Oh my right? God. As with the American plan, the E-series of projects was canceled while still in its planning stages due to concerns regarding the safety and reliability of the launch vehicle, fears of the warhead falling back on Soviet territory, sure. and the potential for international incidents. How do we descend from these people? Well, look, man, I mean, you had, you know, emerging technology and you had this race between two superpowers. I kind of get like you, you, you're at least going to postulate these things. I get they're talking about it. I'm glad smarter uh, decisions. Cool, cooler heads prevailed. Cooler heads yeah, prevailed. Yeah, yeah. yeah, cooler heads yeah. prevailed. Alex Wellerstein, a historian of science and, and nuclear technology said, quote, Project A119 was one of several ideas that were floated for an exciting response to Sputnik that including shooting down Sputnik, which feels very spiteful. They refer to them as stunts designed to impress people. The signing of the, the... I don't know. Really, if you shoot down Sputnik, that's going to impress someone. That just sounds like you're a bully. It does. totally sounds like you're it's a bully, It's a cool right? science project. Sure. Let it go. Just exactly. because you didn't come up with it. Exactly. Right. It's not mine, so I'm going to shoot it down. Right. Fortunately, uh, you had the signing of the Partial Nuclear Test Ban Treaty in 1963 and the Outer Space Treaty in 67, which prevented future investigation of the concept of detonating a nuclear device on the moon. But by that time, both the U.S. and the Soviets had already performed several high-altitude nuclear explosive, explosions. Right, right. We sort of like got out of that noise by the end of the 60s. So I think the story is pretty nuts, right? Yeah, the fact yeah, that yeah, we, for we sure. tried to tried to blow up the moon. What's kind of more nuts is how we found out about this. And this was the part of the story that actually got me to want to make it a segment. I think you're going to love this. Okay. Even to this day. That we, had to be top secret information oh, yeah. for decades. Oh, yeah. yeah okay. But listen to how it okay. came out. So most of the details of Project A119 still to this day are shrouded in mystery. Many of the details have been destroyed. Well, for good reason. <laughs> Yeah. I mean, if I had come up right? with that plan, I'd want you, those details to shred too. shred it. Sure. Yeah, sure. You may not have written it down. You may have just right. said, you know what? I'm going to just go ahead and skip this thought and pretend that it's a, a bad dream. Here's how we ultimately found out about it. One scientist that helped enable this horrific scheme was future visionary Carl Sagan. Oh, wow. The existence of this project was only discovered in the mid-90s by a guy named Key Davidson while researching the life of Sagan for a biography. Mm -hmm. Sagan had mentioned Project A119 on an application for an academic scholarship at the Miller Institute at UC Berkeley in 59. Mm -hmm. So in the application, Sagan gave details of the project research, which Davidson felt constituted a violation of national security. Sure. Sagan just happened to write down in 59 that he worked on this thing nobody had ever heard of. Nobody saw it for 40 years 
until this guy researching Sagan's and said, life. What, what is this? And he was like, what, what is, is this, this top secret information you're divulging here? The resulting biography, Carl Sagan, A Life, was published in 99. Shortly after, a review published in Nature highlighted the discovery of the leaked information. Nature Magazine. Nature yeah. Magazine, yeah. yeah. That led Rifle to break his anonymity and write a letter to the journal confirming that a young Carl Sagan was part of the team responsible for predicting the effects of a nuclear explosion in a vacuum in low gravity mm -hmm. and evaluating the scientific value of the project. Rifle at the time believed that Sagan's activity had been considered a breach of the confidentiality of the project. Mm -hmm. As a result of the publicity this correspondence created, a Freedom of Information request was lodged concerning Project A119. And it was only then that the, quote, a study of lunar research flights, volume one, was made public. 40 years Does that mean there's a volume two that we're not seeing? That's the, no, I think it's hysterical. This is, to me is like history of the world part one. There was no, I, I know now there is a part two, but sure. I do not believe there ever was another volume. We certainly don't know about it if it exists. This report was sort of released as part of the Freedom of Information request, but the other volumes and other documentation revealed other reports were destroyed in the 1980s by the Illinois Institute of Technology. So they are probably gone forever. Yeah. And that ought to be illegal. And well, way. and despite Rifle's revelations, the U.S. government has never officially acknowledged its involvement in the study. Right. So it's just been like this thing that's that's out there. David Lowry, a, a nuclear his, historian. Every every top secret bit of information that we classify as top secret ought sure. to have a, a date and time stamp on it. Gets for when, for when sure. it gets released. Sort of like an NDA expiry. Because you're paying for it. You, sure. you, the taxpayer, are paying for it. You deserve you to know what people were sure. spending your money on, your money doing on in your name. Yep, totally. Look, at the end of the day, it's a good thing that Project A119 and E4 didn't go forward. Yeah, sure. Right? David Laurie, a nuclear historian from uh, the UK, has called the project's proposals, quote, obscene, adding, had they gone ahead, we could never have had the romantic image of Neil Armstrong taking one giant leap for mankind. Well, he'd have taken a giant leap and he'd have gotten cancer. Yeah, well... It is up to debate how much radiation would have been on the moon still because the atmosphere is so thin. Yeah. So not much of it would have probably stayed. Like you probably would have had some unspent uranium. Away. Most of it probably would have been blown off yeah. the surface yeah. of the moon, which is kind of interesting. Either way, I still think the the fact that not just the U.S., but the U.S. and the Soviets both had about, the same idea yeah, right? and both seriously considered it. And it also just goes to show you how for as much as you think you've got a big pardon the expression, Chinese firewall between these two superpowers, they had the idea at the same fucking time. That and, wasn't an accident. And they both named them letters and numbers. <laughs> well, good, I mean, what true. a lame system. <laughs> There must have been an inside job. They right. used letters and numbers. <laughs> they both that used, we recognize. They both used letters and numbers. Why wouldn't you, you know, have a secret name or your secret? It's uh, you know, Project Je Moonblow. Project up. Jellyfish. Totally. Give it something that. That's before they had the good category cube to name the things. <laughs> they also interesting. Both projects targeted the same moon. Unlike Saturn, Saturn we don't have 100, 146 to choose from. Maybe all the other moons are just black and we can't see them. Maybe. Anyway, I thought this was fascinating. The fact that, again, both these superpowers were thinking that a good way to, to, to impress the other guy was to put a, a nuclear bomb on wow. the moon. I, I, I don't think you'd be impressed if someone did that. You'd just think, wow, I, I inhabit the same planet as a schmuck. <sighs> yeah, man. I think in that time, though, I don't think that would have been, you know, uh, there was this quote from a, a British newsreel that was talking about how that Vanguard failure was a big setback in the realm of prestige and propaganda. It was all prestige and propaganda then, right? I mean, that was Crazy. like the definition of the Cold War. So I got to believe them doing that being like, haha, look, we blew up the fucking moon. What have you done? It's apes thumping their chest. Anyway, I thought this was fascinating. And because it's National Moon Day, what better day to talk about trying to blow up the moon? <laughs> okay. Well, I'm glad we got that done. And I'm pretty sure, assuming Elon listens to this show, that he will soon be trying to blow up the moon as well. You know, Elon could buy the moon and then it would go away. <laughs> oh my God. I would love Elon <laughs> buying the moon. Who are the shareholders in the moon? Hmm. All right. Up next, Jeff's going to talk about his experiences looking at the new electric cars. I'm shocked that this is happening. In August, my kid is starting his senior year in high school. That's crazy. His junior year, he drove himself to and from school, which, you know, made my heart hurt. Sure. That meant that three drivers had to make do with two cars. Yeah. A small aside to actually making my heart hurt was that there was limited vehicle access. And that's only because we would love to him, for him to have a car, but he keeps going, no, 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 I'm good, I'm good. I'll just use one, one of yours. Sure. What he means by that is, I don't ever want to have to go to a gas station and put totally. fuel in a car. Totally. I'm just going to take the one that yeah. has gas 
gas in it. Absolutely. Which is great for him. Lovely. And not as good for me. Yep. We talked about Ford dropping the price of the F-150 Lightning by up to $10,000. Tesla's been dropping prices repeatedly all year. Yep. Electric cars keep getting cheaper, so yep. it has come to my attention that electric car may be in my future. I don't know. Sure. The first Tesla Roadster went on sale in 2008. Can you believe that? 15 I, years I ago. I can. I was actually at the launch event for the Tesla Roadster. So there's been a lot of time for refinements and improvements. Okay. I want to state right up front so that no one thinks that I'm more or less into this than I am. I am not an enthusiast. Yes, everyone listening to the show knows you are only an air fryer enthusiast. I am not uh, an enthusiast of electric cars, and I am not an enthusiast of cars generally. I like a car that gets me reliably from point A to point B. That's so you, what I'm looking for. You want transportation. I want transportation. Yeah. I do not want to be... I have a friend who yeah. has a Bentley, uh -huh. and you get in this car, and it's literally like you're driving a living room. Sure. There's yeah, nothing a There's yeah. nothing pleasant about this experience. I do not know why sure. someone thinks this is a fun thing. Sure. Which, by the way, uh, I think most of our listeners have figured this out. I'm the exact opposite. I am what is described as a, quote, car guy. Oh, 100%, so which, is, which is which is why it's... It's interesting that I'm doing this segment and not you. Yeah. By the way, when we started doing this podcast, apparently, apparently you're not a moon guy. I need the moon segment. <laughs> I, I wasn't going to blow it up with a moon? nuclear weapon. <laughs> okay, maybe I'm anti-moon at the end of the day. <laughs> Sorry. When we started this podcast, it was it sort of came out of conversations we had about various things, and it was really nice uh, for me at least uh, that I could always go and bounce ideas off sure. of you and thoughts. And so when it came time to start looking at electric cars, I thought, well, who better to ask questions of than you? Of all the car yeah, people yeah. I know, you you are yeah. deep into the weeds. Uh -huh. I'm not an enthusiast. I don't need to have a fancy sure. car. Yeah. The greatest sin in my house growing up was being a show off. Sure. So I'm not looking to drive sure. a living room. I'm not sure. looking to drive a fancy sports car or whatever. Fair. I want reliable transportation. Yep. I want the air conditioning to work. I, li I sure. live in Southern California. Pretty much beyond that, everything's a Do you want the doors to open when you're, when you're underwater? Uh, you know, that's, that's, why Tesla's, that's why Tesla is not on my list. <laughs> okay. Just want to make sure it's somewhere. I mean, and for lineup. other reasons as well. Sure, but, but you're, you're you're you are nailing something. They're, the Teslas have a lot of problems, and they don't make they don't make my cut. Now, someday they may when they when they fix those things. But for sure. now, in the U.S. right now, there are more than three million EVs on wow. the road. That sounds like a big number. It's actually a tiny number relative to how many vehicles are on the road. But it's how still many vehicles it, are it's on still the road? impressive. Oh, 290.5 million, something like that. And I own half the other one million. You do. <laughs> Most of those ICE vehicles are <laughs> actually mine. House. Turns out I'm the fucking problem. Them, aren't I? You're the one who has yeah. to wash them all. That's yes. why the Green Deal is literally targeting me. I keep throwing that mail out, but it just comes right to me like, can you please get rid of some of your shit? I understand now. There are over 130,000 public chargers, and they are increasing at a rate of approximately 60% per year. I mean, if they continue to increase at that rate, that is literally an exponential increase. That's a lot. I thought, wow, I should get an electric car that has one of those Tesla connections because there's, not gonna, not gonna there sure seem, yeah, they sure. Sure, there sure seem to be a lot of those, and a lot of car yep. companies are adopting those. Yep. It turns out in, in doing my research for my surrounding 30, 40 miles, if yeah. I would ever need one, it, they are a fraction of the charges compared to the other kind. There yeah, are two I, kinds of chargers, basically. There's a third, sure. third kind that yeah. almost no one uses. But of the two main chargers, the Tesla is a distant second. So I, I am no expert on on the, the charging infrastructure at all, but it seems like- There's an app for it. You literally could be an expert in sure. two, two seconds. Yeah, like charge point or whatever. Right. I believe that the the, the Tesla standard is the one that's going to make it, though. You've got, you've got so many other manufacturers glomming on, yeah. and it doesn't really matter it's like just fucking pick one i've, I've looked at the specs i'll tell you why it two. does I'll tell you why it does matter Buzz one's it. an open standard that nobody has to pay sure. royalty to as a practical matter you can get adapters that let anything connect to anything but we need just there one are, ideally yes but there are so many cars who are using the other charger sure. that it would require changing an enormous amount to move them all well over you gotta the, you gotta to change Tesla something standard. i mean yeah. or or intercompatibility plug right all you need is that adapter yeah. i mean yeah, literally yeah. it's just moving two wires from yeah. two two yeah, different yeah, totally. slightly slightly different positions everything else is mostly the same but here's why i think it's not going to matter to you you buy an electric car, you're going to be charging at your house 99.9% of the time. Right. Not to get ahead of ourselves, but if you own a grocery store, think of your customer acquisition and retention costs. Okay. You're going to put DC fast chargers all over your parking lot. It's an outlet. Yeah. You know how complicated installing a giant tank underground that you have to refill every week with pumps everywhere to make a gas station? This is a little wire. Power is cheap. Yep. And now I'm shopping at your store. Yeah. As of July 2023, there are some 56 all-electric vehicles. They call those BEVs. BEVs. They offer ranges such as the Audi e-tron of 222 miles all the way up to the Mercedes-Benz EQS. 350 miles. That's yep. a lot of miles. For most people. There are no oil changes, no transmission fluids. EVs can be faster and accelerate yep. more aggressively than their gas counterpoints. They can be smoother on the road and generally more refined. You still have to change your blinker fluid. 
It used to be the BMWs that never had their blinker fluid change because the blinkers would never work. No, sure. Turns out it's the Teslas now too. I see a lot of Teslas that have, must have bad blinker fluid because they just don't signal. Uh huh. I've been looking at cars on the less expensive side, cars like the Hyundai Ioniq 5N and the Kia EV6, which start with a 220 mile battery pack, but have an option for a 300 mile battery pack. I saw a Mustang SUV parked on the side of the road yesterday. It looked great. They also have an option for a 300 mile battery pack, which I'm not really sure I have any need for. Um, I'm not going to be taking any long trips in, in an EV. This is literally, my son's school is five miles away. The one thing I wonder, uh, and I don't know this to be factual, but I make an assumption. If you get the bigger battery pack, yeah. I'm assuming it means less cycles, which means you would get longer out of the battery pack. Well, that's very true. I mean, that's true of so any- not just range. Yeah. If you want to keep the thing for a long period of time. I do not. Oh. Well, it's a piece of technology. the smallest one you can It's get. going to go obsolete yeah. very quickly, which yep. is partially why- Measured in months. Y- right. Which is yep. partially why you might want to lease it instead yep. of buying it. Totally. Before anyone throws rocks and bottles at me, let me just explain. I know there are even less expensive sure. EVs. That's that's just the range where I'm You're looking, looking at, at, where it's yeah. like, it looks sure. re- it looks reliable, the range is good, and the inside isn't horrible, it looks very yeah. comfortable, and it doesn't look like I'm trying to show yeah, off. Yeah, sure. I don't know, maybe 10-ish years ago, I was sitting in the paddock at, at uh, race cars as a hobby, and we were just shooting the shit, drinking beers, and I said, you know, you realize in like 10, 15, 20 years from now, these are all electric vehicles. Oh, yeah. Like, especially in racing. Yeah. And I was like, no. And I'm like, no, there's going to be dinosaurs like us still doing this shit. We're going to be the weird guys. Yeah. Because like, these are so much Especially for races with lots of curves because accelerating is sure. so much faster on an EV. I mean, we, we do endurance racing, so you're still going to have all sorts of challenges with bat. Like, I don't think anyone's going to want to show up with 5,000 pounds of battery packs. That'll come, later. Right. Swap that'll in come and later. You'll find a way to make that battery clip oh, in yeah. and out really quickly. I'll just put in like 12 farad worth of capacitors. Sure. Yeah. Let's talk about chargers for a second, specifically the time to charge from 10% to 80%, which is what you want to do in an electric sure. car, especially if you're doing quick charging. It can take as little as 18 minutes now to wow. fully charge an Ionic 5 using DC fast charging. 18 minutes minutes. That's great. That's plenty of time to go have, you know, break. take a pee break, yeah. maybe go buy a snack. And sure. by then your car is good to go. You're totally. 80, 80% ready to go, which is high as, as high as you want to charge it. It can take about six hours to fully charge the Ionic 5 using level two charging. Level yep. two charging is when you plug into that 240 outlet, that that uh, yep. dryer outlet that you have. The one that looks scary. Yeah. Or, or if you have like a huge freezer, it might take a sure. 240 outlet. Or if you're at my house, I have one in the garage for the welder. Exactly. You know, as one does. I have one in the garage for somebody. Somebody obviously had a big freezer. Oh yeah. Okay. The problem is it's not fault protected. So I would be afraid to use it for anything like sure. an e- and also for EV charging. I want a uh, industrial outlet. I don't want a consumer grade outlet. I don't want something that somebody bought at Home Depot. Sure. Give me the good one that's not going to melt. Yeah. It can take up to 24 hours to charge the Ionic 5 using level one charging. Yep. That is charging from a standard household outlet. 120 volts. 24 hours to charge your car. That sounds really slow. No, it doesn't. Not for most people. I think that's just fine with no modification, run an extension cord. Many EVs now use a bidirectional charger allowing you to use yes the car's battery to power your home or other devices if you lose power in your house you can literally light up things from your house using your car i mean that is literally the day that i lose in my neighborhood when like the power goes out and all my neighbors or their shitty little teslas are powering their house and there's just me with like almost all my diesel shit and all my gas shit almost every ev does that that's pretty cool really i gotta admit that's pretty cool i know one charger gives you between two and five miles of of charge per hour depending upon how many amps you have coming out your outlet and also the efficiency of your car. Most cars in the class that I'm looking at, it literally gives you around five miles per hour of cool. charge. I clock the average time my car spends in the garage each day and it's on average over 12 hours a day. So roughly 60 miles of charging on the slowest charger mode, the L1. Yeah, but you would never have an L1 in your garage. Why is that? Because you would absolutely invest in the L2 and if your garage already has power and you've already told me it's got a high amp circuit, it'd be super cheap and easy to do. My car would be at full, full all, all the time, time on an L1 charger. Yeah, to me, it's that one day. It's that one day where you're like running around doing something and you're going to come home for three hours and then go back out to a thing. I have two other cars. You know what else I have? I have a fast charger at the Beverly Hills Public Library. You can go to. Where I can charge the whole thing in 18 minutes. I'd still install that. I like like stuff. But then what happens to the next car you're going to buy is electric? It's probably going to be more efficient. Well, you still have to charge it. I mean, that's the direction they go is more efficient, not less. Yeah. Anyway, this is a topic we're probably going to end up revisiting a few times. We are out of time and we have to get out of here. But quickly before we go, have you seen or read anything good? this last oh, week. Oh man, I look I've been on I've been on holiday in San Diego with my kids. I heard you were on holiday. I've watched like nine episodes of Rumble and Crew. What's is, that? It's like a it's like a kid show with like these dogs that like build stuff. My kids oh, I like love that. it. It is actually kind of cute. It's really cute. I'm I'm so in for that world. So that um, when they get a little wound up, we'll turn it on for like half an hour, let them settle down. Although I don't I it. don't believe it for one second though. It does it does stretch credibility cuz my dog pretty much just naps. No, no, no. Well, he's the napper he's dog. He's not No, he's the foreman. Yeah, that's exactly right. He's, 
<laughs> Barkley's the foreman. The other dogs He's, do all the work. Uh, no, that's the that's that's probably the best thing that I've seen. How about you? Uh, I saw a movie called Blackberry. Oh, this sounds have you good. seen this movie? No, but I love the idea. Yeah, it is gripping from the beginning to the end. That's the, awesome. The making of these devices. This is about the phones, right? Yes, yeah, and, yeah, of they, and they were little phones, and you yeah. could send little emails yeah. and things like that on them, and how they came to Don't be. Don't disparage the Blackberry. I wasn't disparaging. You believe me, I little, wasn't you were, disparaging you were trying the Blackberry. To disparage the Blackberry. They made up forty percent of the cell phone market. That's nuts. And they are literally no longer produced. They were like literally too big to fail. They owned the entire market. They owned. There the was market. no way they were going to lose. Like they were the thing. Everybody yeah. had one. I had several Blackberries throughout my day. Oh yeah. I had a Rim device before they were called the Blackberries. Blackberry. The device oh, was sure. still called Rim. I had a Rim nine seventy, and you were just like the the coolest dork. If you had the little wheel on the side, you could read your emails. Oh yeah. And then the iPhone came out, and even then, I fought. My first iPhone was until the four. Yeah. I fought for a long. That was my time. last iPhone. The, I know. Four S was my last. That. My last iPhone. And and I just was like, no, I like the BlackBerry, I like the keyboard. And then one day I was just like, I want to be able to take a picture. It looks like I didn't take it from a potato. Yeah. And then you switch over to the iPhone, and then you're like, all right, goodbye, BlackBerry. You were pretty late in the game to switch Super late. to switch over. I was very late. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It coincided, by the way, with me flipping to the um, to the MacBook. My first MacBook was like, oh eight. Yeah. I, that, I started my ecosystem with the MacBook. Book, and then after like a year or two of that, I was like, all right. And then I got the iPhone. Most people were the other way, but I went yeah. backwards. I highly recommend the, the movie, The End of the Blackberry. It's, it's sort of a sad ending, except for there's one piece of information you get at the very end. It is absolutely delightful, and I won't spoil it okay. for you. It's on Amazon Prime Video. It's excellent. I will check that out. The irony of it being on Amazon Prime. That's the episode. Thanks for joining us for all this nonsense, a truly terrible podcast from The Awful Company. Visit us on the web at nonsense.productions. I'm CJ Little. I'm Jeff Parker. If you like this program, please follow, download, subscribe, and like it at Apple Google podcast amazon music iHeartRadio, or our favorite overcast or wherever you get your podcast from podcastindex.org special thanks to our floor director tara chandler thanks tara and congratulations we'll be here every thursday morning for more nonsense please well, join what, us. Are we, what are we congratulating her for she's getting married oh i had no idea well look at her look how smiley she is in the control room oh congratulations tara we'll be here every thursday morning for more nonsense join us I don't think if they told everybody, that was just a week ago. They got to have told people. I'm not outing them, right? Too late.